I'm here today with Dave Reichert, who's the Vice President at Gordon Thomas Honeywell Government Affairs. Dave is a former U.S. Congressman, as well as the retired Sheriff of King County in the state of Washington. Thank you for joining me today, Dave. Oh, you're welcome. So, Dave, you spent much of your law enforcement career working on the case of the Green River Killer just outside of Seattle. Mm -hmm. And when this spree started back in the early 1980s, we didn't have DNA technology the way we do today. How would that have changed your investigation into the Green River Killer? Well, it would have been uh, dramatic is not even a strong enough adjective to, to use to describe the difference that it would have made. Um, instead of having 60 or 70 young women killed, uh, he pled guilty to 49, by the way, and we closed 51 cases. But if we had DNA back in, uh, in the early 80s, um, scores of women's lives would have been spared. He would have been caught much sooner uh, in the early 80s and not have been able to go on this killing spree for, for so many years. So uh, I, I see DNA as um, this new science that's still developing, but it, it, it saves lives. I mean, that's just the bottom line. It's, it saves lives. I wish it would have happened back in the 80s mm -hmm. um, because we went through that whole period of time looking for the person who committed this crime with 40,000 tip sheets to go through and 10,000 items of evidence. That wouldn't have had to happen. 40,000 tip sheets. Yeah. And, and no computers when we started, mm -hmm. right? We were using Rolodex files, three by five note cards on a right spindle. <laughs> that could have saved Dramatic. lives and dollars and really made a, a much safer community. Well, yeah, and the, you know, the pain that the, the families experienced, uh, they, they wouldn't have had to go through that, the pain and the loss of their loved one. And then, Dave, I know once you were actually elected to Congress, you were really a big supporter of DNA programs such as the Debbie Smith Act as well as the Katie Seppich Act. How do you see that these sorts of programs have really impacted um, public security and, and really investigations? Right. Well, you know, with uh, Debbie Smith, uh, one of the focuses was to work on the, uh, the uh, rape kit backlogs and provide federal funding to, to speed up that process so that we could track down uh, those people that are, are taking lives in a different way. They're raping. Uh, women across the country and and uh, so it was, it was designed to uh, provide money to eliminate those backlogs but both laws really were directed at increasing the um, uh, the, the the samples uh, the, the profiles uh, in CODIS so prior to those two laws um, being enacted uh, our uh, database um, included about less than a million profiles and today it's 17 million so with the more you know more uh, uh, profiles you have in the database the more opportunity you have to catch the person to prevent crime and to, to catch the guilty person but also people um, I think fail to realize that there's opportunities here to also release the innocent folks who have been wrongly convicted of crime so um, I mean, that's a huge uh, benefit to both of the, that both of those laws brought. We're discussing here a little bit too about how DNA technology has advanced over the last couple of decades. And we're really seeing a, a new technology with rapid DNA. How do you see that impacting the ability to, to solve crimes in the future? So, um, you know, cops want to solve crimes, period. They want to protect, they want to serve, or they want to put the bad guys in jail, but again, they want to make sure they don't put the innocent people in jail, right, and that the innocent people get uh, released. But uh, I think what this does, rapid DNA puts this technology in the hands of police officers uh, where they can uh, develop uh, suspects at a much earlier stage in the investigation. 
Uh, I, I always like to think of it this way. So in my day, uh, we would look at a polygraph as a tool. And a polygraph, of course, it's really, uh, it is just a tool. It's, it, you can't use it in court. You fail a polygraph, it just tells you, okay, this is the person I'm going to focus on. Uh, you pass the polygraph, you kind of set that person aside, but you can't really forget about that person. Imagine, though, if we had access to rapid DNA and we had some samples at the scene, and we could take those samples, put them in a rapid machine, say we had five suspects, and we got those five samples, put them in a rapid machine, and we hit on one. The other four are no longer a concern to us. It's not like a lie detector. Now we know. Case is still not solved. We have a lot of work yet to do. But, it, but it's a great tool that gives us that first lead, very substantial lead, into who had committed this, this crime, whatever crime it might be. And the other, uh, I think, advantage here, too, is that as we look at this technology, I think it provides an opportunity for police officers to use it on uh, crimes that are viewed by the public as not so serious, unless you're the victim of a burglary or your car is broken into and your computers and your cameras, et cetera, are stolen from the car. Uh, then that comes, becomes a serious crime, right? It's happened to me. Mm -hmm. But imagine if we started using rapid DNA on those crimes how much we can reduce property crimes. And uh, I think it's a well-known fact, as we learned over the last couple of days, that um, those who commit property crimes are committing other crimes. And some of those crimes that they're committing are serious crimes, are violent crimes. And so we could even prevent those from happening with the, with the use of rapid uh, DNA. Dave, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. It is a very exciting time to be in human identification and forensics. And to learn more, please visit us at thermofisher.com slash HID.